So how did you think? Welcome back. Problem solving today. Here's a problem. How do we break this down and understand this problem? Any problem has a current state and some sort of goal state. Hopefully you can roughly define each of these things. And any given situation that has a current state and a goal state is going to have some givens. Since we're trying to multiply 12 by 76, we have the general principles of mathematics. These are the givens. We have the idea that there is a single correct answer to this question. But we also have, and this is why we say we have a problem, we also have obstacles. We have the limited computational power of our own brains. Maybe for some of us this is relatively easy to solve. Maybe for some of us this is torture to even look at. We have time. If I can't solve it in the time allotted, why should I try? Next, we are doing some sort of cost-benefit analysis before we get into trying to solve the problem. What benefit to me is it to solve 12 times 76? This is going to determine whether and how we approach solving a given problem. And I chose math as an example, not just because it's a concrete and bounded situation, but also because so many people have their self-images standing in the way of them even addressing simple math problems. If you fancy yourself bad at math, you may avoid the math problem. If you fancy yourself good at math, you may avoid the math problem. Why? Well, because if you screw up, then you, it'll be a threat to your self-image. Anxiety. How do we get around or through the anxiety we have regarding mathematical problems? These are all of the human elements that lie between us and our solution, between our current state and our goal state. Now, any of these obstacles could also be seen as frames or framings of the problem. So if I frame a mathematics problem in terms of anxiety or in terms of me or in terms of the cost or the benefits of the problem, these different framings are going to influence how, whether, and to what effect I solve the problem. Framing was summed up pretty nicely by Daniel Kahneman in his book Thinking Fast and Slow when he said people do not choose between things, they choose between descriptions of things. And while I'm pretty sure the behaviorists would disagree with that, it is probably true or accurate or useful in most situations. So before we start the problem solving lecture today, there's a general observation that there are two great but contrasting approaches or philosophies to tackling problem solving or making decisions in general. Wisdom discernment, judgment, comes from knowing when to use or when to lean more heavily on uh, one approach over the other. Uh, and these two approaches are first the measure twice cut once approach or my preferred statement of it uh, from Abraham Lincoln, if I had five hours to chop down a tree, I would spend the first four sharpening my axe. So this is one approach to tackling problems. Do, do a lot of thinking, a lot of preparatory work, so that when you jump in, you're ready. The second approach, which is, for the most part, contrasting the, sec the first, is increase your fail rate. Iterate throw something out, see what sticks. If, if if it doesn't stick well enough, you iterate, you change it based on the feedback that you get. It's also called a rapid prototyping sometimes. So you can see there's the, you know, measure twice, cut once versus increase your fail rate. If you're a perfectionist, then you would likely prefer the first approach. Spend four hours sharpening your axe and then just cut it, cut the tree down with your nice sharp axe. This perfectionist approach, this prepare so that you're ready uh, could potentially paralyze you though. So you could be Buridan's ass caught between two options and you don't know how to choose between them because you can't get the, 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 the perfect answer. Uh, we often don't know which tools or measures, so sticking with the metaphors we've used with, with axes, uh, uh, we often don't know which tools or measures we will need uh, until we start actually hacking at the problem. So maybe we need the second approach if you are more proactive or what you might describe as a doer, then, then you'd probably prefer the second approach of increasing your fail rate. But of course, if you are a, you know, jump in, see what sticks, fail faster so that you can improve, 
if you if you do take this approach, you may be wa wasting quite a bit of time addressing problems that a more reflective person would or could have seen coming, and then you could have saved time by seeing them ahead of time. My wife works for an architectural engineering firm, and she's described to me an orders of magnitude rule of thumb, which is if it costs $1 to fix it in the planning stage, then it will cost $10 to fix it in the building stage, and it will cost $100 to fix it after the building has been built. And that makes a great case for the measure twice, cut once approach, uh, but that's for building buildings, and not everything is building buildings. Other challenges, like maybe, I don't know, trying to figure out how to talk to someone of the opposite sex when you're young, and starting to get interested in such things. You can spend four-fifths of your time practicing chat-up lines and conversation starters in front of the mirror, but most of the good correctives that make you better at actually interacting with people will come from the non-verbal behaviors, the subtle responses that these actual individuals, these members of the opposite sex, will give you if you're actually interacting with them. So in that case, I would think increase your fail rate, iterate, and you'll get better by doing, not so much preparing. But of course, when you put either one of these strategies, the measure twice, cut once, or the increase your fail rate approach into reality, and realize that reality is a game that is played itself iteratively, then you realize you can use both strategies. You can talk to a whole bunch of people of the opposite sex and then go off and spend your four hours sharpening your axe and then come back and do it a little better. And you can spend a lot of time measuring twice and cutting once, making buildings that have been properly planned through, and yet still learning from all of the iterations of these well-planned buildings that have experienced failures over the years. Now these two approaches, increasing your preparation versus increasing your fail rate, are not a mutually exclusive dichotomy. Presenting them both and saying that they're separate is not saying that there are two types of people in the world, perfectionists versus proactive people. I in part like the comparison because I believe I exist in both camps. I, for example, am proactive by temperament. I believe in my bones that actual learning happens most and most effectively when you're actively screwing up. Try it sometimes. Your limbic system has your back and it will make you learn far better than the best cognitive simulations that you can come up with in your four hours of preparation. Yet, I'm a perfectionist by training. My grandfather showed me how to be ten steps ahead of a process or a challenge by taking 10 steps back and considering it in the most painstakingly detailed manner possible. My father said that he couldn't play chess with my grandfather, despite having tried on multiple occasions, because my grandfather was too slow in choosing his moves, because he wanted to see everything mapped out ahead of time before he committed to anything. And I think I'm my father by temperament and my grandfather by training. Those of you who are a little more anxious might be like my grandfather, by temperament, i.e. measure twice, cut once, but like my father by training, i.e. you've learned to force yourself to take a step before you know it's the perfect step. Either way, jumping into the solution of a problem does involve a leap. We tried for a couple decades modeling how people solve problems with the kind of perfect thinking model. We've presumed that people could somehow go through all possible options and then pick the best option from this list of all possible things. And then we realized that you would need infinite time to compute all the possible options for your actions and and then all an infinite amount of time to compare any two of these options to each other. And then Herbert Simon came along and he said, well, we, we satisfy. S somehow we come up with an arbitrary cutoff for where we're satisfied with a solution. And once we satisfy that cutoff, that's when we've made a decision. And these two approaches, the more perfectionist one or the more impulsive, proactive one, could, by Herbert Simon's model, represent different thresholds for satisficing. When do you have enough information to act? If your satisficing threshold is lower, i.e. met quickly or more easily, then you may be able to iterate quicker, get feedback from the environment faster from your actions. But if your satisficing threshold is higher, well, maybe your first action is more effective. After all, a stitch in time saves nine. 
That said, if we're being honest, our first approach to solving a problem is usually actually not to tackle uh, a problem like multiplication with our thinking, but rather with a device. Hence, we're going to start this lecture with cognitive offloading. So what's cognitive offloading? Doing something to reduce the load on your mind. With our example of a multiplication question, doing something to reduce the load on your mind would be reaching for a calculator. This will save your brain having to do some work. It's the same principle behind using your fingers in order to keep track of what you've counted. And in a lot of the cool cognitive science paradigms, where we're looking at a threshold for when people start to cognitively offload, we will see the angle at which we need to display text before someone tilts their head in order to adjust for the angle. So you are used to reading text that is level. And if I tilt a page, so maybe I tilt the right side of the page downward, so the left side of the page is higher, your brain has to do a little bit more work, especially when you jump from one line to the next line to line them up. So the more tilted the page is, the more cognitive work you save by tilting your head with the page to adjust for the page's tilt. You are offloading the challenge of lining up the words properly that your brain would have to tackle into the world by tilting your head so that your brain does not have to tackle that translation. The language used in these paradigms is if you don't tilt your head when you are reading tilted text, then you have to internally normalize the text, which is more work. So rather than normalize the text internally, you normalize it externally by tilting your head in order to make it easier for you to read the text. So offloading into the world is using objects to ease the cognitive demand. When you have to keep track of yourself across time, you can use intention offloading. If I intend to buy certain things at the grocery store, I can make sure I follow through on this intention by making a list. One of the big problems of memory is our faulty assumption that we will have as much ease recalling in the future what we recall with ease now. Oh, of course I'll remember this. See, I'm going to remember it right now. And then we list off the five things we're going to buy. So then we think, okay, well, that was easy for me to remember. I'll remember when I'm at the store these five things. It's great that you have confidence in yourself, but it's better to make a list. Just in case, calendars are a great source for intention offloading. It saves you the trouble of having to remember, and it potentially serves as a reminder for your motivation. Oh yeah, I actually wanted to do that. An example of how I offload intention is if I have to remember to take an object somewhere, I will put that object in front of the door, or if I can't, then I will put a note pertaining to that object at the door. So if I want to be sure not to forget the presents for uh, the in-laws, when we go to visit the in-laws, we'll put the presents right in front of the door. The one potential problem with this approach is if you put the presents for the in-laws in front of the door too early, then you may get used to climbing over those presents in order to get out the door. And when it comes time to go to the in-laws, you may, out of habit, step right over the presents leaving them there to be discovered as soon as you step back into the house from having visited your in-laws. Now one might predict from prior learning in this course that it would be better to offload intention than to be confident in one's memory. But interestingly, in the lab, what we tend to see is that if you have high confidence in your ability to remember, at least in lab tasks, your performance is roughly the same as those who had lower confidence but offloaded their intention, i.e. somebody who wrote a note. This suggests that those with higher confidence may be accurate in their self-assessment and their confidence in their ability to remember. So when participants are less confident, they are more likely to set a reminder for themselves, i.e. more likely to offload their intention into the world, which serves as an equalizer i.e. brings their actual accomplishment of their intentions up to the same level as those who were confident enough that they didn't need to write or offload their intentions. So here's that relationship 
more simply displayed on a graph, your metacognitive insight, uh, i.e. your lower confidence in yourself to recall or to follow through on your intention, to the extent that it leads you to offload that intention, i.e. to set a reminder, that low confidence helps you to match the success of the higher confidence individuals. How about offloading into other people? This is called a transactive memory, or memory we have with other individuals. There's a rough division of labor in my household. My wife seems to keep us on track in terms of time and scheduling, and I tend to keep everything organized in terms of place. So I tend to ask her questions like, what time are we leaving, or even what day is it? And she tends to ask me questions like, where do we keep the flour? Is there room in the freezer for the leftovers? And would the big bookshelf fit on the east wall? The point is, she is remembering the temporal things, and I am accessing her memory, and I am keeping track of the spatial things, and she is accessing my memory. We have transactive memory together. But of course, we have transactive memory, not just with other people, but also with other things that might act as people. There's something called the Google effect, whereby our memories are getting worse because we can just Google things so there's no reason to remember things anymore. How can I be so clueless as to not know what day it is? Well, I don't really have to know what day it is. I have a watch, I have a calendar, and I have my wife who takes care of such things. Why would you need to know historical dates or word definitions when all of those are in Google? Is there really that much of a threat that the power's going to go off or that the Wi-Fi's going to be off? Your brain seems to think not, so it goes right ahead and forgets anything that it can look up on Google. And this isn't just Google-specific. So about a decade ago, Sparrow and Wagner noticed that the idea of computers seemed to be primed whenever individuals were faced with difficult questions, i.e. the types of questions one might want to offload onto a processing or a thinking or a looking the answer up machine. Moreover, if there's even the idea that whatever facts or details that are in front of you will somewhere or somehow be stored somewhere else, your brain seems to get this message and then process and retain what is in front of you less thoroughly and less well. We saw this in the memory lecture with pictures. The better the picture you took of the thing, the worse your memory will be for it, generally. But replacing the memory for the thing that you took a good picture of will be a memory for where that picture is stored. Neat experiments involving file folders on PCs have shown that as your recall for the thing itself decreases, your recall for where the information is stored on a computer increases. I encounter this conundrum often when a student asks me a good, incisive question, and rather than recall the answer to it, I can recall the book I have that the answer could be found in. So other examples of transactive memory, your relationship with your GPS is a complicated one, it makes life easier for you, but it also tunes you out from life in interesting ways. One might predict that if you have cognitively offloaded the task of navigating to your destination, that that might free up your mind for attending to things that you see on the way to your destination. But in fact, it tends to turn off your brain more generally. People in cognitive science studies recall less about a drive in general if they had the GPS on. Without the GPS, your brain is turned on to process things other than just navigating. And of course, since you relied on the GPS to navigate for you, you would be less able to successfully navigate that route without GPS in the future. Not only that, you will, in part as an accurate interpretation of your lowered ability, given you've used GPS, you will be less confident in your ability to navigate on your own, making you more likely to rely even more on the GPS, which is a feedback loop now of two things, decreasing confidence because you have a decreasing ability to navigate on your own, and an increasing dependence on the GPS. And of course there's the camera phones example. The better the picture you take, the worse your independent memory seems to be of the event. If we know things like memory storage and problem solving are being taken care of by something else, whether it's GPS or camera phone or our spouse, 
we get worse at recalling and executing it. So we correctly get less confident in ourselves, at least in cases where we know we are dependent. So spell check has made us worse spellers, and correctly decreased our confidence in our ability to spell. Calculators have made us worse calculators, and correctly decreased our confidence in our ability to calculate things. And using GPS or Google Directions makes us less able to navigate routes that we have driven successfully, and correctly lowers our confidence in our ability to do so. These are all cases where we appear to have insight into ourselves and our dependence on offloading onto technology. It was mentioned that knowing we could look something up decreases our tendency to remember that thing, so one would think that use of Google would reduce our confidence in our ability to remember things, but we seem to have the opposite relationship with Google. For example, if we give participants a trivia quiz and we randomize such that one group can use Google in order to answer the trivia questions and another group cannot, we find that those in group 1 tend to rate their memory as being better than those in group 2. They assess their information processing as higher or better and when we ask people to put their money where their mouth is and predict how well they're going to do on future quizzes, explicitly telling these Group 1 members that in the future they will not be able to use Google, the Group 1 individuals inflate their expectations regarding themselves and make much higher predictions for how well they will do than Group 2. And it goes a bit deeper than that. We don't just take credit for Google, which is essentially what the Group 1 individuals were doing. We actually come to see ourselves as having the positive traits of Google e.g. good memory, good information processing. And the easier and more intuitive the interface of Google gets, i.e. the easier it is to get your intended answer, the smarter people tend to think that they are without Google. It's a testament to the programming and the intuitive interface of Google that the normal relationship we have with our cognitive offloading tools like calculators and GPS is reversed with Google. We don't think that because we've used a calculator in the past and it made math easy that we can do math without a calculator. And yet, results seem to show that we tend to think we're wicked smart because we've looked stuff up on Google before. Google is likely driving a global Lake Wobegon effect with a nefarious undertow such that as people think that they are increasingly above average in their intelligence and problem-solving abilities, the thing that is giving them such confidence is actually taking those skills away. But of course, as long as the power is on and the Wi-Fi is on, there's really no harm to this offloading process. As long as no EMPs wipe out the calculators, we don't need engineers to know how to do long division. So there are obvious strengths to offloading. It's going to save you time and effort, and it's probably less prone to error. Certainly this is the case for calculators and calendars. But beware of offloading, creating dependency, and beware of the overconfidence that comes, or the underconfidence that comes, from having been able to offload in the past. So let's compare algorithms with heuristics. An algorithm is something that is guaranteed to give you a solution. The most common formula we use in statistics is the formula for the mean. You just follow the steps. You take all the observations you have, you add them all together, and you divide the sum by the number of observations that you summed. This, by definition and by process, is guaranteed to give you the mean. This does not ensure that the mean is the correct answer to whatever question you're attempting to address with the mean, but the algorithm gives you the mean every time. As most of you hopefully remember from high school, the algorithm for multiplying 12 by 76 would go a little like this. You start by multiplying 2 and 6. Since it gives you a number above 9, you're going to have to carry the value in the tens column and put it up by the 7. Since 2 times 6 is 12, the 2 goes down in the ones column of the product and the little red 1 is carried. Next, we multiply 2 and 7 which gives us 14, but then we add the carry to 1, which gives us 15. So far, so good. We are one-third of the way through the process. Next, we use a zero placeholder in the ones column of the second row of our solution. Then we multiply 1 by 6 to get 6, 
and 1 by 7 to get 7. The final third of our algorithmic journey involves adding these two rows of product together. 2 plus 0 is 2, 5 plus 6 is 11, carry the 1 from the tens column of 11, 7 plus 1 is 8, plus 1 is 9, so we have our sum, which is our product, 12 times 76 is 912. This is how I learned to do it, and if you were lucky, it's also how you learned to do it. This demonstrates the strength of algorithms because we have simple, broken down, guaranteed steps that lead you to the correct answer. But of course, breaking things down could cost you extra time, and just because it is an algorithm doesn't necessarily make it the correct tool for whatever job you have to do. If the initial question was, when was somebody born if they were 12 in the year 1976, then multiplying 12 by 76 is probably not the best tool for the job. There are subtraction algorithms for that. But let's tackle that problem using heuristics, mental shortcuts, that tend to save us time and energy and tend to be correct, but also lead us into predictable errors. How can I solve 12 times 76 without breaking out the algorithms, without remembering my grade 4 math? Well, some of you may have been trained in something called mental math. I have had two different students in my psychology of education classes who were diagnosed with mathematics disorder, who had been in grade schools that used the mental math approach, and they only clawed their way out from under that diagnosis by going back and learning grade school math algorithmically. In other words, this so-called intuitive, holistic approach to teaching math appears to be giving university-level thinkers specific learning disabilities. So here's how it works. Since 10 times anything is very easy to compute, I can break off a 10 from the 12 and multiply 10 by 76, since I know it's just going to be 76 with another 0 on the right side. What remains should be a little more manageable than the full 12, i.e. what remains is 2 times 76. So what I have now, rather than one complicated problem, are two slightly easier problems. I just have to remember to add the two products together at the end. So 10 times 76 is 760, and 2 times 76 is 152. Adding them together, I get 912. But of course, since this is a rather ad hoc heuristic approach, this isn't the only way to arrive at a solution using mental or holistic or intuitive math. Let's come up with another heuristic option. Let's say I don't like the 76, but I'm okay with 75. Maybe I've recently done some units on percentages or fractions, so I happen to like 75 because it neatly represents 3 quarters of 100. So my simplification in this case is to multiply 12, not by 76, but by 75. And then I just have to remember to add in that 12 that I took off the 76 after I've multiplied 12 by 75. But of course I haven't actually made the 12 by 75 quite easy enough. So I'm going to use the same trick that we used last time, and I'm going to break down 12 times 75 into 10 times 75 plus 2 times 75. So my heuristic simplification gives me 10 times 75 plus 2 times 75 plus 12. Now I have two sufficiently easy products that I add together and then sum with 12. And of course what I'm doing now is I'm chaining heuristics, which is fine as long as you remember the neat concatenated path that you've made for yourself and how to reconstitute the values together after you've made this god-awful mess. But look how nice my final line is now. I just need to add 750 by 150 and 12. I get 912 again. Whenever I give this lecture, there are at least two people who put up their hand and say, I was taught math this way, and I've never had any students defend this way of learning math. The general response of students who were taught this intuitive approach over the algorithmic approach is that they were ripped off. The usual next question is, why would anyone teaching math use this approach? The justification was, when you look at how people, adults in the real world, do math, they tend to use this approach. 
and a heuristic approach where they break things down into simpler problems so that they can solve those simpler problems and then hopefully remember to put things back correctly in the end. So the teacher's college instructors, in all of their vast wisdom, said we're going to teach people to use this approach right from the beginning so maybe they get better at it if that's what they're going to do in the end anyway. Now there's lots of room in math for neat shortcuts. But my advice is don't teach shortcuts before you teach navigation. And let's not throw out maps. So we saw that the heuristic approach uses the simpler, easier, and more familiar. And if I only need approximate numbers, you can imagine how powerful this holistic and intuitive approach might be. But imagine, especially if in my chaining heuristics example, I forgot how to recompose the answer. I forgot to add that last 12 or the 150. It's easy to break the rules that you just made on the spot. And arguably, especially that second heuristic example, the so-called simpler or quicker heuristic approach could not only make us more prone to error, but could actually increase the effort that it takes for us to solve a rather straightforward problem. That said, like most humans, I do tend to use the intuitive heuristic holistic approach when I'm solving math problems. It's only the training from my grandfather that makes me pause and say, wait, maybe I should do this correctly. The heuristic approach tends to be comfortable and it's usually good enough. And if we have expertise in the topic or experience in the topic, our ability to utilize shortcuts might be very impressive. There's a whole course at the University of Toronto called Street Fighting Math, where people learn to apply on the fly quick and dirty tricks to get the correct mathematical answer. But if you're not a math major and you have an ace to that course, you might want to heed the cautions of heuristics, which are their questionable accuracy due to their not being the guaranteed way to find the correct answer, and their potentially adding labor to your solution quest. Moreover, if the approach feels more familiar or intuitive to you, that sense may prevent you from checking your work which hopefully you also learned how to do algorithmically in grade school. Next, creativity. Creativity is generally broken down into two parts, or aspects. You have divergent creativity and you have convergent creativity. With divergent creativity, we are trying to assess how open and widely ranging your mind is in terms of the potential associations that it can come up with. One approach that kind of plays out like a game is headlines. What we might do here is we might get you to read an article that is several paragraphs and then get you to write a headline that succinctly and in a way that grabs attention summarizes what the article is about. Here you obviously get points for being accurate about the contents of the article and for capturing its various topics but the creative challenge is not to come up with a headline, it's to come up with a bunch of headlines. And the more headlines, which are both accurate and informative about the article below them, that you can come up with, the higher your divergent creativity score will be. Now some of you may be thinking that how well you perform on such a task is going to depend quite a bit on the mood you're in. And you are quite correct. In positive psychology, we have something called the broaden and build hypothesis. The observation is that whereas depression narrows your worldview, your emotional range, your desires, as you withdraw, happiness does the opposite and broadens you out in part by making you more creative, helping you to see more solutions to problems, make connections across more divergent things, and see more solutions. The idea not being that all of those solutions will be good, but that having more may lead to one or more better ones than having fewer. My favorite study from the broaden and build literature was the Dr. Lollipop study. Now apparently it is very difficult to diagnose liver disease. A lot of the presenting symptoms point to other more common diseases, so we were interested in seeing what would help doctors more accurately diagnose liver disease. And we landed on candy. Doctors were, were randomized to either just make a case determination, the control group, or to receive a candy and then 
determine the diagnosis of a case. The treatment group and the doctors who got a 10 cent candy were statistically better at diagnosing the difficult to diagnose liver disease. And this is an example of broaden and build because what tends to prevent the doctors from diagnosing liver disease is that the symptoms tend to present like more common disorders. The working theory here is that the candy leads to happiness which leads to divergent creativity which leads to considering the less common diagnosis which leads to the realization that it's correct. And broaden and build is also applied to convergent thinking as well. So let's say I have a riddle type of problem for you or a problem that has a specific solution. Generally these types of problems are tricky because there is an obvious answer that is wrong that we tend to get stuck on or partial solutions that distract us from solving the full problem. And the best example for convergent creativity would be the remote associates test give the word that connects these other words together call pay and line the word is phone phone call pay phone and phone line how about this one French car and shoe I don't know how often y'all use shoehorns but French horn car horn and shoehorn Despite not being classed as difficult, this one tends to be tricky for students. Mower, foreign, and atomic. The word connecting them is power. A power mower. A foreign power and atomic power. Give this one a shot. Board, magic, and death. Blackboard, black magic, and the black death. Weight, out, and pencil. This one's a little trickier. This one is lead, so lead weight, lead out, and lead pencil, or pencil lead. For a fun COVID-19 isolation activity, you can do by yourself or over the internet with a friend. Go to the remoteassociatestest.com. Not only do they have a hundred odd of these, but they're also labeled as to their difficulty level, so you can have a lot of fun. Now, one of the psychological theories that really got me interested in psychology in high school was incubation theory. The idea that we can come to creative solutions by walking away from the problems that we're trying to solve. This can also serve as a good introduction to the unconscious. Because what appears to happen is your brain appears to keep working on the problem, despite your attention being shifted somewhere else. So there's a few famous examples from history. Uh, there's Watson and Crick's discovery of the shape or structure of DNA. There's Archimedes leaping out of the bathtub and saying Eureka. And there's a pretty good quote from John Cleese that I can't specifically recall. But it's roughly, sometimes I'll go to bed having a problem to solve and I'll wake up not only having the solution to the problem, but also having no idea how I could possibly not have had the solution before. Now with Cleese's example, you have the important aspect of sleep consolidation. In refiring and consolidating the events of the day, the brain perhaps fortuitously wired some aspects of the problem to some aspects of the solution. So you may know some people who say they do their best thinking in the shower. Maybe because it's a frame change. Maybe because it's relaxing. Maybe because it helps you think of something else so that your unconscious can solve the problem. And perhaps we should specify here that those touting incubation theory would use the longer term cognitive unconscious to dissociate themselves from Freudian connotations. Incubation theory is used to explain how we come to insight problems seemingly all of a sudden. So insight problems are those that there's no halfway solution. You're either there at the solution or you're not. Or at least that's how we experience them. My favorite example is this. Two boys were born on the same day, month, and year to the same parents, and they are not twins. How can this be? Now just imagine the class working on the problem for a few minutes, or at least what feels like a few minutes, and then a couple light bulbs going off, and someone putting up their hand saying they were triplets, or quints. The experience of coming to this solution 
is not generally one of a reasoned, logical process of elimination type of thinking. The experience of coming to the answer is rather, well, I all of a sudden had it. Incubation theory has also been used to explain why the best strategy for solving remote associates questions, like the ones from three slides ago, is actually to not try to solve them. Rather, let your mind wander, and the solution will probably come to you. This is in contrast to an analytic approach, where you try to reason things out. In other words, you do better at the remote associates test if you just relax and let your cognitive unconscious incubate the problem and throw a solution at you. Either approach will work, but mind-wandering works better on average at getting you solutions to remote associates. Question. Now, solving problems. Nearly every model says we are split in terms of how we solve problems. We have a system one, an unconscious, intuitive, copy-paste, save-your-brain-cells-work type of system, and system two, which brings the tools of culture, language, logic, and traceability to a more formal and explicit approach of working out the problem. Since system one is usually correct, we use it to solve most of our problems. But one challenge that leaves us with is system one is not traceable. For the most part, we lack insight into how or why we used system one to arrive at the solutions we did. For an analogy, there's an old story from the Life's Like That section of Reader's Digest, which was my bathroom reading when I was a kid. And the story was about a woman cooking a turkey on Thanksgiving for the first time. One thing she did was she grabbed a knife and she cut off the end of the bone that protrudes from the drumsticks of either leg of the turkey. And that didn't make much sense to the husband, since that's a perfectly good handle for when you're eating the drumstick. So he asked her, why did you cut the drumstick bone off when you cooked the turkey? The wife responded, well, that's how you have to do it to cook the turkey, which is, of course, not an explanation. It's simply a restatement of the conclusion that she came to. When the husband pushed for an explanation, she finally said, okay, well, I guess I don't know. This is just how my mother did it, and I learned from her. But what they were able to do was they were able to call the mother and ask, why is it that you cut the bones off of the legs, the protruding bone part off of the drumstick legs, when you cook a turkey? And the mother's response was cackling laughter. In the mother's house, either the turkey pot or the stove was too small to accommodate the turkey, so the mother had to saw off the protruding bone parts. Her daughter, who did not have this space restriction, did not have to do this. So she found out her reason for engaging this behavior was not an appropriate reason, so she didn't have to do that anymore. The point of the story is that she was able to call her mother and ask where this particular behavior or habit came from. When we're dealing with System 1, we actually can't go back and ask. It's not traceable like System 2. So in the analogy, we would end up stuck at the stage where she's justifying the behavior, but not with a coherent argument, and rightly being questioned for it without an adequate response. An example you might be familiar with would be what have been called the seven most costly, damaging, and dangerous words in business. We have always done it this way. This is not a reason. It's just question begging. If I'm asking you why a policy exists, or why your management is structured the way it is, saying this is how you do it does not inform the question. Can you email the test data to me? We don't do it that way. Well, that's not a reason. We never give reasons. Well, nothing you say means anything. Well, that's how we've always done it. It's tough to improve when you're not sure what your process is, because it's difficult to know what you might change. But of course your brain doesn't tell you that your reasons are untraceable. Rather, your brain gives you reasons. They're just not necessarily the right ones. The word we have for this is confabulation. For most of your decisions, your system one, your copy-paste, intuitive system, solves the problem for you, and then you justify whatever behavior you engaged in. Specifically, the left hemisphere of your brain acts as a press secretary and justifies your every behavior 
in the most socially acceptable and reasonable way it can. The dramatic version of this is Capgrass Syndrome. You wake up and things feel different. You used to feel certain emotions when you look at individuals, and now you do not. And rather than conclude that maybe your the emotion centers of your brain have been affected by some sort of neural insult, you conclude that your loved ones that you now do not feel that affection for have been replaced by aliens, monsters, robots, clones, simulations, spies. In other words, imposters. And in order to justify that confabulation, there must likely, of course, be other conspirators, like the therapist who is trying to convince you perhaps your family members are not replicants. In Capgras syndrome and in split-brain patients is likely where we see confabulation in its purest form. And the patients are just trying to make sense of their experience. But since most of us do not have Capgras syndrome, let's look at a more relatable example. We had some students watch a video and then answer questions about it, but some of the questions were tricky in that in order to answer the questions, you had to treat as if they were serious some false statements. So the question, what did the boy say was stolen, introduces something false because the boy did not say that anything was stolen, and yet you must answer that question. A week later, participants come back into the lab and we ask them what they recall seeing from the video. We include some things that were not in the video, including the false statements that they made in response to the leading question or questions, and 20% of those false statements end up being recalled as seen. Also included were some false statements or false responses from other participants that the individuals had not themselves made, of which 10% were incorrectly recalled as seen in the video. Further demonstrating that we're more prone to misremember or misendorse things that we came up with. Now the example I gave you was of college students in the US. If we do the same thing with younger and younger students, we see more and more impressive feats of erroneous memory, such that once you get down to the first graders, they are recalling more than half of the false misled statements they made as having been in the video. The point is one we've seen before. Creating the explanation ourselves makes us twice as likely to think it is real or correct. This is what I call the small problem of confabulation. Our left hemisphere comes up with an explanation for the solution or decision that our system one just kludged together and then we like it and think that that confabulation is accurate. So far I would say that's just a small problem. We believe ourselves that doesn't seem too terrible. But the big problem of confabulation, as I see it, is that our confabulations usually have an element of truth to them. And unfortunately, where we have an element of truth, we tend not to look much further. We have accomplished partial correctness. Now let's consider a relatively harmless example of partial correctness. We say something like, I ate pasta last night because I love pasta. You are, of course, not wrong. But that is also, of course, not the full reason for why you ate pasta, or not the full story of why you ate pasta. There's also situational factors, like you had pasta available, the ingredients were there. You also had the time to cook or order pasta, the means, something made you think of pasta, some stimulus or set of stimuli led to your response. You had the knowledge of how to make or get pasta. And there was an absence of more attractive options. Or, if they were present, you didn't think of them. If this seems rather pedantic, good, I want you to get that feeling from this example. Why would I consider all of these other contextualizing factors when I do love pasta, and that is, at least in part, or at least in the largest or most important part to me, why I ate the pasta? Well, some creative looks at partial correctness have revealed, for example, that people will, on average, choose to get paid less for the same job, choose to move to a location that they preferred less to move to, and to accept fewer benefits at said job in order to have a male boss rather than a female boss. And this misogyny is stronger in females than in males. In these clever studies, we ask people about many scenarios, so we can statistically throw them together, 
and see which aspects of the scenario seem to be driving their decisions. And it turns out that one of the factors that leads people to make suboptimal choices is the sex of the boss in the story. Now the point here isn't the prejudice in society, the point is that when we ask people what was driving the decisions that they made over the course of this long experimental session, none of them state that behind the decisions they made was in part their desire not to have a female boss. For each scenario, they had a reason, including when we asked them why they would accept less money, a response that would come up is, well, there would be more pressure if I was being paid more. Participants came up with all sorts of explanations when confronted with their decisions, but tended not to discover their own gender bias. One thing we do quite often is we study the cheating behavior of students. An older paradigm for this is seeing whether they change answers when they have to, or when they get to, grade their own test. This is actually fairly common, and when we confront students about why they cheated by changing their answer from an incorrect one to a correct one when they were supposed to be just grading their work, the most common response is that, oh, I meant to choose the right answer. In other words, it was a slip of the pen. My intention was to choose the correct one. I knew the correct answer and was therefore only making the world more just by correcting what was a motor mistake and not a knowledge mistake. Now, in some sense, these students are not necessarily lying because they appear to believe these confabulations. I.e., for all we can tell, these students really believe that they had, back when they selected the wrong answer, intended to choose to bubble in a different response. In other words, they believe their own confabulations. And yet, when we present these same students with these same confabulations as stated by other students, they do not believe said students. Oh, that person said that they meant to choose the correct answer, but they didn't? Huh. Well, that might have been true when I said it, but it's of course not true when they said it. Sounds like bull to me. Now, we can even feed this contradiction back to them and say, so you do not believe this excuse or explanation when it's said by someone else, but you believe it of yourself. And they will respond with, yes, because it's true when I say it and not when they say it. Now, these students are, of course, partially correct, because I am sure when they saw the correct answer, what motivated them to believe their confabulation that they had intended to select a different answer is that seeing the correct answer reminded them of what they already knew. So they're partially correct that, in some sense, despite the fact that they didn't recall it at the time of answering the initial question, they did have the knowledge that could have answered the question. So they're partially correct. And I would argue that this is the big problem, or the big barrier, between their current state of knowledge and the truth. They're not entirely wrong, so why should they update their belief and maybe realize that their initial wrong answer was earnestly chosen at the time. You could also argue that partial correctness could be one of the reasons why we don't necessarily clue into some of the biasing contextual factors that we talked about in the first third of the course, so we don't tend to credit the warmth of the room or the warmth of the drink in our hands for influencing our decision about a person we're interacting with. There isn't really a good reason to even think of these influences, because the person's right in front of us, and there's plenty about them that seems warm that we are correct about. Not much is lost from not zooming out and looking at the rest of the picture. So there's all sorts of difficulty involved in believing that we have biases, and there's difficulty in admitting that we have biases, and keep in mind that biases is not used with negative connotations here. A bias is a leaning toward a given response, answer, preference, feeling, etc. It's not synonymous with prejudice. And there's arguably even more difficulty in spotting how we are biased, in part because our partial correctness, conferred by our confabulations, satisfies our need for understanding. Your confabulations are yours. They are sensible to you, available to you. Since they come from you, they are usually valuable to you. And often, they are nice and simple. There generally isn't much call for a multifaceted explanation. So our small problem of confabulation was 
right or wrong, we tend to like what we come up with. And the big problem of confabulation is we tend to come up with something that's at least partially correct. And if we're not wrong, there isn't much to motivate further investigation. Okay, but what does this have to do with problem solving? Confabulation tends to prevent us from noticing problems, or from looking for the solutions to the problems that we do notice. Since we have some confabulated explanation, which may provide us with a partial solution, we may not see the need to look much farther than what our left hemisphere provided us with. There's a related concept called a functional fixedness, which is the observation that when we are presented with an object that already has a purpose, we tend to be less capable of seeing that object as having other purposes, i.e. we get stuck in whatever frame or scheme or image was originally provided to us. Once something has a function, we tend to have trouble thinking of other functions for it. It's an imperfect analogy, but the idea with confabulation is, once we have an explanation, we tend to get stuck on it. A classic example is the candle problem. You have a candle and a box full of thumbtacks. You want to attach the candle to the wall. How do you do it? Whether or not you come up with the desired solution is going to depend on how I present the items to you. If I present you with the thumbtacks inside the box, you are less likely to arrive at the desired solution, which is to tack the box to the wall and put the candle on the box. If I instead present you with the tacks dumped out of the box, you are more likely to see the box as a potential little shelf for the candle and come up with, i.e. converge upon, the solution of using the box as a little shelf for the candle. Seeing the function of the tack box as a box, rather than a shelf, makes you less likely to land on the idea of using the box as a shelf. In other words, improving our thinking or our explanations is difficult because our own thinking gets in the way, and the smarter we tend to be, the better we are at justifying whatever thinking is currently in our way. In this sense, intelligence can and does make fools and fanatics while those armed with protective thinking tools to counteract motivated reasoning turn their intelligence to the task of doubting and growing wise. That's enough for today.